Good morning. How's everybody doing today? We're starting a new series today, um, as a new series on being real. Uh, as Christians, there's this stigma about how we behave sometimes that the, the outside world has, right? The, about how we perceive sinners around us, and, and a lot of people will just say, oh, you Christians are just hypocrites. But what we want to do as we work to know God better through the Bible and to understand not only who the creator of all things is, but also we want to know what God desires from us. And through all of that, we want to be real, right? We want to be authentic. We want to be kind of a, you see what you get, right? Now, I occasionally make mistakes. Thank you. I, I don't know everything. Almost, not quite. Uh, and there are even opinions that I have that occasionally creep out that aren't quite aligned with the life that I'm trying to live like Jesus, right? Now, I know none of you guys are in the same boat as me with that, but we believe that God desires for Rochester Christian Church, for us to be a loving and authentic Christ-centered family. It's who God is calling us to be as a church family. It's who God's calling us to be as individuals. But authenticity can be difficult to spot in today's world with all the social media, with the selfies, with the filters, and the, the pressure to kind of be better than your neighbor, right? God made us who we are, and he knows how we live. He simply wants us to live an authentic lifestyle with an authentic faith. And authenticity says a lot more to other people than we may realize in the moment. Let's look today at what God has to say about us being real, authentic people that he loves and who he wants us to be. So for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at what the Bible has to say about that uh, so we can better be who God has called us to be, who the Bible calls us to be, uh, who Jesus saved us to be, and that is that loving and authentic Christ-centered family. If you'll pray with me, then we'll open up our Bibles. God, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for giving us the scripture that we can look in and see uh, victories and failures, and we can be encouraged by both of those. God, we can get to know you through scriptures and know what your desires are for us. God, I pray that through today's uh, scriptures, through today's lesson, through our time together, we would understand a little more about being real, about being authentic, and living a life that honors you. Thank you so much for loving us, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians. We're going to be in chapter 2. Uh, we'll start with the first two verses for now. It reads, For you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our visit with you was not without result. On the contrary, after we had previously suffered and were treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, we were emboldened by our God to speak the gospel of God to you in spite of great opposition. So Paul's writing to this church uh, these, uh, in the city called Thessalonica. This city was the largest city. It was the most important city in Macedonia. It was the capital city. Uh, they had an obvious Greek influence there with Greek philosophers and those cults all speckled all throughout. Big representation from the Greek gods and the temples that went along with those. But they were also devoted to Rome, right? Even their co coins in Thessalonica proclaimed Caesar as divine god. But also, in addition to this little bit of diversity with the Greek gods and Caesar as a god, they also had uh, influence from the Egyptian gods, right? They had those temples there, a lot of prominent worship of the Egyptian gods. And as is applicable for our story today, there was also a Jewish presence there. There was enough of a Jewish presence that there was a synagogue, and that's where Paul went first. As he traveled around, he would always go first to the Jews and their synagogue and begin to proclaim the word of God pointing toward Jesus, not just the Old Testament of, uh, and the law and the prophets and things, pointing toward Jesus. So that's where he started, and when they would get mad at him and kick him out, he would move on his way. So the Jews didn't like the message that Paul was bringing. So after a few weeks there in Thessalonica, he had to move on to the next city, but that few weeks was enough time. These believers in Thessalonica became his brothers, his sisters. They were his family in the faith. And now Paul is reaching back out to them with this letter. We see it as 1 Thessalonians, spoiler alert, that means there's at least one other letter we call 2 Thessalonians. Um, but here in today's passage, he's reminding them of the good things that happened during his trip there to see him. He's working to point out his own authenticity and the joy that he has from the results of his visit there. And that's super important that Paul's not promoting himself with this letter. He's not writing them in Thessalonica and being like, hey, don't forget me. You know, I was a big part of your life. I'm very, you wouldn't be where you were without me. He's not doing that at all. Paul's not promoting himself, but rather he's reminding them of how God is working through the, excuse me, through the believers of Thessalonica. 
Paul says that his visit was not without results. While Paul was there in Thessalonica, it says that many Jewish uh, men and women believed in Jesus. It says many Greek men and women accepted Jesus as a result of the efforts of Paul and his team. When he arrived in Thessalonica, he writes that he was emboldened by God to share the gospel with him despite opposition. And I think the opposition that he faced before getting there is actually what caused him to be emboldened. Paul's arrival in Thessalonica is recorded in Acts chapter 17. Acts records Paul's missionary journeys as he traveled through basically the Roman Empire, sharing the gospel of Jesus and telling people about Jesus. And so in chapter 17, it talks about his arrival in Thessalonica. So I thought it'd be good to look back in chapter 16 and kind of read what happened before that. What was the opposition that Paul faced that got him so emboldened? So we'll be in Acts chapter 16 for just a minute. If you want to open, turn with me. Otherwise, the words will be on the screen. But as we get here, Paul's in a city called Philippi. He, he gets there and he goes to uh, where he finds out there's a, some group, a group of people praying, meets a, a woman named Lydia. She sells uh, purple fabric. She's wealthy. She invites Paul and his crew to stay with her. She's got the space for him, which is great. And then he also, as he's traveling around, kind of having these conversations, there's a slave girl who starts following along behind him. And she's telling people who it is that Paul's proclaiming. And the slave girl has this demon. that So she's telling people that Paul is proclaiming the name of Jesus. And it gets really annoying to Paul. And in chapter 16, verse 18, she did this for many days. And it reads, Paul was greatly annoyed. Turning to the spirit, he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out right away. So that's where we're at. We'll pick up in verse 19 here, and it reads, When her owners realized that her hope of profit was gone, because she would predict the future by the demon, so that's how they made their money. Now that demon's gone, their hope of profit is no more. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Bringing them before the chief magistrates, they said, These men are seriously disturbing our city. They are Jews and are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against them, and the chief magistrates stripped off their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they threw them in jail, ordering the jailer to guard them carefully. Receiving such, a, such an order, he put them into the inner prison and secured their feet in stocks. Now, that would be enough to stop most people, right? What do you do here? How, how do you come back from that? I'm not even talking about getting up, getting on a boat, and heading to Thessalonica. I mean, just how do, you, how do you get up from this? What do you do? Paul and the crew had just gotten stripped down publicly, beaten with rods, and thrown in jail, all for helping a little girl be free of an evil spirit, all for the good news of Jesus. What do you do? Can you just, like, check out, like, okay, well, God, we tried. Thanks. Peace out. I'm going home for a bit. What's your response? Well, for Paul and Silas, in Acts 16, verse 25, it says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Right, about midnight. Like, I can't stay up till midnight when I don't get beaten and stripped publicly during the daytime. These guys had the day that they had, and here they are around midnight, in jail, feet in stocks, singing and praising God. And not only that, it reads, and it's an important note to see, the other prisoners were listening to them. These guys, still filthy and bloody from their earlier beatdown, and they continued doing exactly what it was that got them put in jail in the first place. Worshiping Jesus, praising and proclaiming the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They didn't stop. How's that for authentic faith? How do you even find the strength to do that? Or maybe the better answer is, how do you find the strength to do anything but that? Paul and Silas in jail, praising Jesus. Suddenly there's this earthquake that comes and it shakes, shakes the walls, shakes the ground, shakes the chains right off their feet, shakes the doors of the prison open. That's not part of our story today, so I'm going to jump ahead. The good news here of this story is because of what Paul was doing, because of his praising, he got to baptize the jailer and the jailer's entire family. Beaten, bloody, and super tired, he got to baptize their, their whole family even through the opposition they faced. Can you imagine if Paul had just given up? He would have missed that opportunity, not only to witness to the other prisoners in the jail, but he would have missed the opportunity to share Jesus with the jailer and his family and see them baptized. Paul moves on from Philippi. Imagine how he looked arriving in Thessalonica, right? I mean, the jailer helped wash his wounds, but you get a little bit of time for those bruises to really shine. I don't think he was as emboldened because of that victory, as he was by the encouragement that God is going to do great things regardless of how we feel, regardless of what's happening, how we may feel beaten down by life. 
Maybe Paul was emboldened because he was trusting God more and more and was recognizing his own insufficiencies and his own inadequacies. Who can stop the word of God? Paul's a witness to that, and that very fact emboldens him as he goes into Thessalonica to preach the word of God. So now he's writing this letter to this church, these believers that he met for just a few short weeks. He wants to ensure that they know that he is legit, that he is sincere, that his faith and his passion for them to know God is authentic. He goes into Thessalonica fearlessly preaching and sharing what God was doing, boldly telling these people what Jesus had done for them. He wants to ensure that they understand that Paul has nothing to gain by coming to them, right? But they have everything to gain from what he's sharing with them. He's there for them. The way Paul shared the gospel to these folks in Thessalonica after the beating that he took in Philippi and the opposition that then followed him into Thessalonica proves that his only goal was, in fact, to proclaim the gospel, to share Jesus with everyone he could. There's no personal gain. He's not scamming them to get anything from them. He wasn't trying to, to line his pockets or, or boost his own popularity. His only desire is to give them the gift of the good news of Jesus. Paul didn't let things stop him from praying. He didn't let getting severely flogged prevent him from singing songs and praising God. Paul trusted God, and the opposition he faced resulted in his boldness. We believe that God desires for RCC to be a loving and authentic, Christ-centered family. Our goal is to be real and authentic, to share the gift we have in Jesus. Has anyone ever heard of Jesus? A couple of you have heard of Jesus. We might need to start over. Um, but his goal is to share what we have in Jesus, and that's what it means to be real. When we share Jesus, the world comes to know him through us. When we sit quietly, the world's still going to know Jesus. We just don't get to be a part of that. Let's read on verse 3 and 4 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. For our exhortation didn't come from error or impurity or an intent to deceive. Instead, just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please people, but rather God who examines our hearts. So Paul and his team, they're emboldened. This word comes out, they're emboldened. They're going there boldly, ready to go, no holds barred. Because the hard times they endured previously in Philippi, Paul goes on to reiterate that he didn't arrive there by accident, right? He didn't head for Thessalonica battered and bruised in order to trick them or mislead them. This is clearly God guiding him to see them through everything that he's faced. He and Silas were approved by God. And that's the next note that Paul wants to make here as he writes this letter to this church to remind them of his visit there. Before they even took this journey that led them to Philippi and then to Thessalonica, we know this is Paul's second missionary journey through Acts. It says they were commended by the brothers and sisters. That is, they were sent out by the church leadership, by Peter and the gang. They prayed over them and they sent them to take the message of Jesus out to the Gentiles. These two were commissioned by the church in Jerusalem. They were sent with the purpose of spreading the gospel prayerfully by the apostles and the elders of the church. More important than anyone else in Jerusalem, more important than Peter, more important than anyone else with the title, is that they were there, as Paul writes, approved by God and entrusted with the gospel. It wouldn't matter if Peter sent them out. It wouldn't matter who sent them out if they weren't going approved by God. Paul and Silas approved and entrusted with the gospel to please God. If we are going to call ourselves Christians, if we're going to try to live our lives the way the Bible tells us Jesus lived his life, if we truly believe that Jesus died on our behalf, then a huge part of that is that we're going to need to be real and authentic with our faith. We absolutely must do as Paul did, and we speak. Now, that's a gross oversimplification of what we're called to do, but at its core, isn't that what we do, right? We go and we speak. As a follower of Jesus, you are approved and entrusted to share what Jesus has done in your life. We can show others what he's done for us. We speak. You speak the truth of Jesus with your whole life, and sometimes you even get to use words, right? In the real world, we're bold because of opposition. With all the good and the bad, through all the ups and downs, when life goes the way we planned or when life fails us, through the times when things fall apart, when we feel helpless, when we feel hopeless, when we feel like we're spiraling out of control, we speak the good news to the people around us to please God, and the world comes to know him through you. 
the next couple verses, 5 through 7 here in our passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. For we never used flattering speech, as you know, or had greedy motives. God is our witness. And we didn't seek glory from people either from you or from others. Although we could have been a burden as Christ's apostles, instead we were gentle among you as a nurse nurtures her children. Paul's writing to these people that he knows. He met them during a difficult and literally painful time in his life. Literally. And Paul knows that the Jews are trying to undo his work. Even before he left, the Jews are trying to undo the work that he was doing there. It's important, as Paul explains, that the Thessalonians know he came to them with pure motives. It's important as we go out and live our lives to share the gospel, that the people around you that you're telling about Jesus know that your motives are pure. You're not there to trick them. You're not there to, to sway them, to collect money from them. You're there to give them the gift that Jesus has given you. Paul says he didn't use fancy or elaborate words to entice them or to trick them. You don't need to use fancy or elaborate words. You don't have to know all the Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, all the root words, all the stuff that all the big books have that are really good paperweights. You don't have to have motives to collect wealth from them or anyone. Paul says he was gentle among them. We have the same motives as Paul. We're gentle among the people. I'm going to share a, a, a different translation of Paul's words here in the message version. I love the way the message version kind of puts this in plainer English. It reads, we never use words to butter you up. No one knows that better than you. And God knows we never used words as a smokescreen to take advantage of you. Even though we had some standing as Christ's apostles, we never threw our weight around or tried to come across as important with you or with anyone else. We weren't standoffish with you. We took you just as you were. We were never patronizing, never condescending, but we cared for you the way a mother cares for her children. We loved you dearly. Not content to just pass on the message, we wanted to give you our hearts. And we did. Paul proclaimed the message that God gave him to carry, plain and simple. Jesus died for you. Jesus loves you. Paul didn't stand on the corner with a bullhorn condemning everyone, giving them the message so that he could quickly run away. Paul spoke the word of God and he gave them his heart. He was vulnerable with them. Paul treated these people and he, he talked with these people the way that Jesus would have done. And he did that because he believed the message he was called to share, the message about what Jesus did for him, for Paul, was too essential for them to know. He had to give them this message. It's that important. Paul laid it out plain and simple. He knew he just had to go and share. That's what it means to be real. In the real world, we're bold even in the face of opposition. We speak to please God. We say the things we say to please and honor God, and the world gets to know him through us. We speak the name of Jesus, and we do it because of what Jesus did for us. We do it because that is too big and too significant for me to not go and tell other people. If my faith is real, if my life is for Jesus because he showed me his life was for me, then I have to open myself up to help the world understand what he did for them. If your faith is real, if your life is for Jesus because he sure showed you that his life is for you, then you have to open yourself up to the world and help them understand what Jesus did for them and just trust God with the rest of the details to be what the Bible calls you to be and to be who Jesus saved you to be. We're going to have a song, and during that song, this is, this is your time to, to hear the word of God, to make a decision on how that's going to impact you. It's important that when we come into word, whether, whether we're in church together, whether you're home alone, that the word of God changes you. That when you get to know God more each day, that it changes you to be more and more like him. So I invite you to pray. We'll have some people in the prayer room over here to my right. Go and sit down with them and have a prayer. If you don't want to get up and walk across the room because you're embarrassed to go do that, do it anyway. Uh, but if you still insist on staying in your seat, stay in your seat. Grab the person next to you, have a prayer together that we could be real and authentic, that we could be the best representative of Jesus in this world that we could possibly be. I invite you to be vulnerable as you leave out of this building, as you go back home, as you go to work, as you go wherever you're going, look for those opportunities to be vulnerable and tell people about Jesus with your life. Open yourself up to share Jesus and encourage people who are hurting. It's okay to tell someone they're beautiful because that's what God thinks. It's okay to tell someone that you love them because Jesus loves them. And you do that because you know that Jesus loves you. And that's the message that's so important that we take out. And if our faith is real, if we're authentic, we have to tell 
others. And we have to be like Jesus in a broken world. And that's what it means to be real. Will you pray with me? God, thank you so much for this example in Scripture of, of what Paul did with his church in Thessalonica. God, I pray that we could be real and authentic with our faith, that we wouldn't try to promote ourselves as being better than we are, that we wouldn't try to put on a face of being holier than we really are, God, but we would go out into the world broken and bruised and just share your love, God, because that's the message of what you've done for us, and we take that message out because it's so important that we share it with others. God, I thank you for giving us this time together, and I pray you be with each one of us. Help us to understand your word. Help us to know you better, and through that, to go out into the world and proclaim your name. Thank you so much for Jesus, and it's in his name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together.